You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner in English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 232 by Rudolf Steiner, 14 lectures entitled Mystery Knowledge and Mystery Centers, a revised translation by Pauline Werle. This is Lecture 14, the last lecture, entitled The Striving Human Soul During the Middle Ages. We will utilize the last of these lectures to bring together what has been said about the various mysteries belonging to one or another region of the earth in order to show you, at least from one point of view, the form the mysteries took during the Middle Ages, approximately from the 10th to the 15th century. I do not speak of this epoch because it is particularly complete in itself, but because it can be used to show the form human striving was taking during that period in the most civilized parts of the world. The spiritual striving of that period is often described as the mysteries of the Rosicrucians. This description is in a certain sense quite justifiable, but it must not be confused with the charlatan element we often meet with in literature without realizing how much charlatanry there is in the things we read. The name Rosicrucian must direct our attention to that deeply earnest striving for knowledge which existed during those centuries in almost every region of Europe, central, western, and southern. We must realize that the figure of Faust as described by Goethe, with all his deep striving of soul, with all his earnest effort, is a later figure no longer anything like as profound in soul as many a researcher to be found in the medieval laboratories. These were individuals of whom nothing reaches us by way of history, but who, nevertheless, labored earnestly between the 10th and 15th centuries. I spoke in the last lecture of the predominantly tragic disposition in the most earnest researchers of the time, Their outstanding trait was the feeling that they had to strive for the greatest knowledge that can be creatively active in human beings, and yet they felt not only that they could, in a certain sense, never reach this highest goal, but that from a certain point of view it was even a dubious matter whether they ought to strive toward it. I have said that we do not find among these scientists in their alchemical laboratories a theoretical trivial knowledge, but a knowledge that had to do with the whole human being, with the innermost feelings and deepest longings of the heart. It was indeed a knowledge of the mind and heart. What was its origin? You will readily understand it if I try to give you a picture of this tragic skepticism of medieval research. Let me first direct your attention once again to the form taken by human cognition in very ancient times. The most ancient form of human knowledge, intimately bound up as it was with the life of the human being, was not of the kind that would have led people to look up to the planets and perceive the mathematical sublimity, the mathematical movements which people calculate and let their imaginations loose on nowadays. At that time, each planet as well as everything else spread out over the expanses of the heavens, was a living being. And not only living, but an ensouled being, a spiritual being. Human beings spoke constantly of the families of the planets, of the families of the heavenly bodies, for they knew that just as a blood relationship exists among the members of a human family, there also exists an inner relationship between the members of a planetary system. There was a parallel in their knowledge between what is to be found on the human level and what is revealed out there in the cosmos. Let us take one region of the earth as an example and show from that the kind of knowledge human beings came to acquire in the most ancient of the mysteries when they looked up to the sun. 
There were mystery sanctuaries of the kind which were arranged with a specially prepared skylight, so that at certain times of the day they could look at the sun with its light diminished. You must realize that the most important chamber in many an ancient sun mystery center was one with a skylight in the roof, the window of which was filled with some kind of material, not glass of our modern kind, but a material through which the orb of the sun was seen as in dim twilight. The pupil was then made ready to observe the solar orb in the right inner mood of soul. He had to make his feeling mind so receptive and perceptive that when, by way of the eye, E-Y-E, he opened his soul to the sun with its dimmed-down light, it made a strong and lasting impression upon him. Of course, many people look at the sun nowadays through smoked glass, but their perceptive faculty has not been tuned to take the impression into their souls so powerfully that it remains with them as a very special impression. The impression of the dimmed orb of the sun received by the pupils of these mysteries, after they had undergone exercises for a long time, was a quite specific one. And anyone who, as mystery pupil, was able to have this impression could truly never forget it. It also increased his understanding for certain things. Then, after the pupil had been prepared by the majestic impression made upon him by the sun, he was led to experience the special quality of the substance gold. And through this sun preparation, the pupil actually came to a deep understanding of the quality of gold. If you look into these things, it is painful to realize how trivial are the descriptions given in modern history books of why one or another ancient philosopher allocated gold to the sun or gave the same symbol to gold as to the sun. People no longer have any idea that what was known about this in olden times proceeded in reality from long exercise and preparation. A pupil who looked with his whole soul into the dimmed light of the sun was being prepared to understand the gold of the earth. And in what way did he understand it? His attention now awoke to the fact that gold is not receptive to that element which is normally the breath of life for organisms and to which most other metals are thoroughly receptive, namely oxygen. Oxygen does not affect or alter gold. This non-receptivity, this obstinacy of gold with regard to the element through which human beings receive life, made a deep impression on the pupil of the ancient mysteries. He realized that gold cannot approach life directly. Now, neither can the sun approach life directly and the pupil learned that it is well that neither gold nor the sun can directly approach life. For he was gradually led to realize that because gold has no relationship with oxygen, the breath of life, when it is introduced in a certain dosage into the human organism, it has a quite definite effect. It has no relation to the etheric body, no relation to the astral body directly, but it has a direct relation to the quality of of thinking. Just take a look at how far thinking is removed from life, especially in our modern age. A person can sit like a log of wood and think abstractly with great vigor. But on the other hand, through merely thinking, he cannot bring about any change in his organism. Human thought has become more and more powerless. However, this thinking is set in motion by the ego organization and gold introduced in the right dosage into the human organism can bring back power to thought. It restores to the life of thought the power to work down into the astral body and even into the etheric body. Thus gold enlivens the human being by way of his thinking. One of the secrets of these ancient mysteries was the secret of gold in connection with the sun. The relationship between the substance gold and the cosmic working of the sun made a particular impression on the pupils of these ancient mysteries. 
In a similar way, the pupil was led to experience the working of the polar opposite of gold. Gold is an impulse for the quickening of human thinking, so that human thought can work down as far as the etheric body. And what would be the polar opposite to this? The members of the human organism are ego organization, astral body, etheric body, and physical body. And we can say that by means of gold, the ego organization becomes capable of working down into the etheric body. The etheric body can then work on the physical body. But gold brings it about that one can actually hold the thoughts in all their power as far as in the etheric body. What is the polar opposite of this? It is an activity that manifests itself when something attracts the breath of life, oxygen, to itself, either in a human being or in nature. And just as gold is unyielding where oxygen is concerned and repels it, and therefore has no direct influence on the etheric or the astral body, but only on the thought world of the ego organization, carbon has a direct affinity to the oxygen in the human being. As you know, we breathe out carbon dioxide, we make it by combining carbon with oxygen, and the plants require carbon dioxide in order to live. Carbon has the exact opposite properties to gold. Now, carbon played a great part in the oldest mysteries. In one direction, they spoke of gold as a particularly important substance in the study of the human being, and in the other direction, they spoke of carbon. In these most ancient of mysteries, they called carbon the philosopher's stone. Gold and the philosopher's stone were very important things in those ancient times. Gold and the philosopher's stone. Carbon was the philosopher's stone. Carbon appears on earth in a variety of forms. Diamond is carbon, a very hard carbon. Graphite is carbon. Coal is carbon. Anthracite is carbon. Carbon appears in the most diverse forms. However, by means of the methods that were customary in the ancient mysteries, human beings came to understand that there exist still other forms of carbon besides those we find here on earth. And in this connection, the pupil in the mysteries had to undergo another preparation. For besides the sun preparation, which I have already told you about, there was also the moon preparation. Added to the ancient sanctuaries of the sun mysteries, we find a kind of observatory in which a human being could open his soul and his physical vision to the forms of the moon. Whereas in the sun... Training the pupil had to behold the sun at certain times of day in a diminished light. Now for weeks at a time he had to expose his eyes to the different forms that the orb of the moon assumes by night. Gazing thus with his whole soul, the pupil received a definite inner impression which gave him fresh knowledge. Just as the human being, by exposing his soul to the sun, became capable of understanding it. Similarly, by exposing himself to the phases of the moon, the human being became capable of understanding the moon. He learned what metamorphoses the substance of carbon can undergo. On the earth carbon is coal or graphite, diamond or anthracite, but on the moon this substance is silver. And that was the secret of the ancient mysteries. Carbon is silver on the moon. Carbon is the philosopher's stone, and on the moon it is silver. The knowledge that was impressed so profoundly on the pupil in the ancient mysteries was this. Any substance whatsoever is only what it seems in this one place, at this one time. It was sheer ignorance not to know that carbon is coal, diamond, or anthracite only on the earth and that what exists on the earth as diamond or graphite is on the moon silver. If we could at this moment dispatch a piece of ordinary black coal to the moon, it would be silver there. A vision of this radical metamorphosis was what the pupil attained in those ancient times. 
It is the foundation not of that fraudulent alchemy of which one hears today, but of true alchemy. This ancient alchemy cannot be acquired by any such abstract means of acquiring knowledge as we have today. Nowadays we observe things or we think about them. Alchemy could not be attained in that way at all. Nowadays a scientist directs his telescope to a certain star, determines parallel axes and the like, and does calculation after calculation. Or if he wants to discover what a particular substance is, he applies the spectroscope and so on. But everything that can be discovered in this way is infinitely abstract compared with what could once be learned from the stars. And this ancient wisdom, this true astrology, could only be learned, as I said yesterday, by establishing a living exchange with the intelligences of the cosmos. When a human being was able to hold converse in his soul, in his spirit, with the intelligences of the cosmos, that itself was attainment of knowledge. What orum signifies for the human organism is connected with the secret of the sun and through exposing his soul to the being of the sun, a human being entered into a relation with the intelligences of the sun. It was these beings who could tell him of the properties of Orum. In like manner, a human being entered into a relation with the intelligences of the moon. Indeed, human beings came to learn of these intelligences of the moon as those beings who were themselves once in olden times the great teachers of earth humanity, when the primeval wisdom was taught on earth. They were the same beings who today send their forces and impulses down from the moon. They withdrew from the moon at a certain time in evolution, and there in the moon they founded a colony after the moon had separated from the earth. Thus those intelligences who once lived on the earth and are today the moon intelligences have to do with this secret, the carbon-silver secret. Such was the character of knowledge in ancient times. Let me quote another example. Just as the pupil could receive impressions from the sun and moon, so by means of a further preparation of soul, still he could also receive impressions from the other planets. And one of the secrets thus obtained was the one relating to Venus. Venus is studied today through a telescope and is regarded as being like any other star or planet. Just as the human body is studied by investigating, say, a section of the liver and then a section of the brain, actually only investigating their cell structure as though they were not two radically different substances, in the very same way a student will direct his telescope to Mercury, Venus and Mars, and so on believing all of them to be composed of substances of a like nature. In ancient times they knew that if human beings were studying the moon or the sun, they could attain their aims by means of what was directly related to the physical earth, the elements of earth, water, air, and fire. If they extended their observation in a spiritual way to the moon, they came to the ether, If, however, they extended their observation to Venus, they came to a spiritual world, a purely astral world. What we see physically as Venus is only the external emblem of something which lives and has its being in the astral element, the astral light. Where Venus is concerned, physical light is something entirely different from physical sunlight. Physical sunlight still has a relationship with what can live on earth as earth-produced light, whereas Venus light, and it is childish to think of it simply as reflected sunlight, shines forth from the spiritual world. If the pupil exposed his soul to this light, he came to know which intelligences were connected with Venus. These are intelligences who live in continual opposition to the intelligences of the sun, and a great role was played in the ancient mysteries by this opposition between the intelligences of Venus and the intelligences of the Sun. People spoke with a certain justification of a continual battle between them. There were starting points for such conflicts 
when the Venus intelligences began attacking the Sun intelligences. There were times of intensified conflicts. There were culminations, catastrophes, and crises. And in what lay between an attack and a catastrophe or crisis you had, as it were, a section of that great battle of opposition, which is taking place in the spiritual world, and appears in an external form only in the astrological and astronomical relationships between Venus and the Sun. It took place in successive phases. And no one can understand what lives on earth in the inner impulses of history if he does not know of this conflict between Venus and the Sun. For all that takes place here on earth in the way of conflict, and everything else that happens in the evolution of civilization is an earthly image of this conflict between Venus and the Sun. Such knowledge existed in the ancient mysteries because there was a relation between the human beings on the earth and the intelligences of the cosmos. Then came the epoch of which I have spoken, the epoch from the 10th to the 15th centuries A.D. The medieval investigators in their alchemical laboratories, were in the process of human evolution no longer able to reach up to the cosmic intelligences, though they could still reach the nature spirits. They made numerous experiments, of which I gave you an instance in the last lecture, when I spoke of the transformation of oxalic acid into formic acid, numerous experiments of the kind which were to reveal to them the presence and activity of the gods in the processes and things of nature. But they could do so only when they had prepared themselves fittingly through that spirit of piety of which I told you for converse with the nature spirits. Now, let us look more closely at the actual situation of such an investigator. He stood in his laboratory and he could say to himself, quote, I bring substances, retorts, and heating ovens into my laboratory, and I do various experiments. I ask nature certain questions by means of my experiments. And when I do this, the nature spirits enter my laboratory with their revelations. I can perceive them. Close quote. For this continued right up to the 15th century that nature spirits approached a Rosicrucian investigator who was properly prepared. However, he still knew theoretically that in ancient times investigators had not been able merely to reach the nature spirits, but could come in touch with the higher cosmic intelligences who spoke to them of the secret of gold connected with the sun, the secret of silver and of carbon connected with the moon, and of the historically important secret of Venus, and so on. It is true that they had records preserved by way of tradition, telling them how there had once been this knowledge, but the records were not especially important to them. If one has once been touched by the Spirit, then historical documents are not so terribly important as they are for our modern materialistic age. It is really astounding to see how infinitely important it is to many people when some discovery is made, such as the recent case of the skeleton of a dinosaur being found in the Gobi Desert. Of course, it is an important find. But such discoveries are never anything but separate broken fragments, whereas, in a spiritual way, we can really enter into the secrets of the cosmos. Historical documents were certainly not likely to impress those medieval investigators. It was in another way that the medieval alchemists acquired knowledge of how human beings had once been able to attain this cosmic knowledge, but that one could now reach only the nature spirits behind the elements of air, fire, and water. It was like this. In moments when certain observations of nature were being made, or certain experiments being performed, and the investigators approached the sphere of the nature spirits. Some of these spirits told them that there had once been human beings who had a connection with the cosmic intelligences. That was the pain which gnawed at the hearts of these medieval investigators, that the nature spirits spoke of a former age 
when human beings had had a connection with the intelligences of the cosmos. And the investigators had to say, quote, These nature spirits can still tell us of a past age, which has vanished into the unfathomable depths of human knowledge and human existence. Close quote. Thus this ability of the medieval alchemist to reach the nature spirits was really a fraught one. On the one side he approached the spirits of nature, the spirits of air and of water. He approached gnomes, sylphs and undines in their living reality. On the other side there were some among these beings who told him of things that overwhelmed him with despair telling him how humanity had once been in connection not only with the nature spirits, but also with the intelligences of the cosmos, with whom the nature spirits are still connected to this day, but whom human beings could no longer reach. That was the feeling of the medieval alchemists, and it often came to expression in a far more sublime, a far more grandiose and tragic manner than we find in Goethe's Faust beautiful and powerful though this is. The utterance that Faust addresses to the moon, to the shining silver moonlight in which he longs to bathe, would have been made with much greater depth by the scientists between the 10th and 15th centuries when the nature spirits told them about the secret of carbon and silver, a silver which is also closely and intimately connected with the human being. For what was it that these people of olden times experienced alongside those communications? They experienced not only that aurum is connected with the sun, but how aurum works in a human being, how argentum, silver, and carbon work in a human being, and similarly how other metals related to the other planets work in a human being. In olden times, people experienced these things in the circulation of the blood in their body. They experienced them in a conscious way. They felt the blood streaming and pulsing through their head, and at the same time, they felt it as a picture of the whole earth, this streaming of their blood through the head. And that sphere where the head is not enclosed by bone, where it opens downward toward the heart and the chest, they felt to be an image of what rises up from the earth into the atmosphere. Thus, in what a human being learned from the cosmos, he recognized the metamorphoses that went on in his own organism. He could follow the planet in its passage through all his organs. We find here a confirmation of the penetrating words of Mephistopheles, where he says, quote, Blood is a very special fluid, close quote. For in its metamorphosis our blood reflects those wonderful metamorphoses from carbon to silver. All this also lives in human blood. Thus did the medieval scientist regard the loss of knowledge of the cosmic intelligences as a loss of his own humanity. And it it is in reality but a faint reflection of this experience that we find in Faust when he opens the book of the macrocosm and endeavors to rise to the cosmic intelligences, then shuts the book again because he is unable to do so, and contents himself with the spirit of the earth. We have here only a faint echo of the dreadfully tragic mood we find in these medieval scientists, whose names have not even come down to us, when, on entering the sphere of the nature spirits through their alchemical investigations, They heard from them how human beings had once had a connection with cosmic intelligences. Now all this is deeply linked with what had to develop in ancient Greece when it became necessary for the mysteries of Samothrace, the mysteries of the Kabiroi, to be reduced to the philosophy of Aristotle, which then played such an important role in the Middle Ages. All the time, Below the surface of what we know as Aristotelianism, there continued to work powerfully, although tragically, right on into the 15th century, what I have been able to sketch for you in this fragment of those times. Indeed, it was the case that behind the Macedonian epoch there were mysteries that reach as far as Greece. There will be more about this in the coming historical lectures. Mysteries that saw deeply into the secrets of the cosmic substances and their connection with the cosmic intelligences. 
mysteries that for the first time began to descend from the cosmic intelligences to the nature spirits. It was as though they were deliberately prevented from seeing as far as the cosmic intelligences and had their attention directed instead to the nature spirits. This was the crisis that came about at the time of Aristotle and Alexander. In all that happened at that time, we can still see that the abstractions of Aristotle are rooted in the old mysteries. Anyone who knows about the carbon-silver secret and then reads the observations of Aristotle that have come down to posterity, his most important ones have not survived, reads what is written there relating to the secret of the moon, will understand at once the connection of those olden times. More light will be shed on these very things in the lectures I intend to give on the historical development of humanity from the standpoint of anthroposophy. At the close of this lecture, I am reading the, uh, the footnote to the um, comment by Steiner of carbon becoming silver on the moon. And this is the footnote. Readers may find this sentence a stumbling block in an age of space exploration when carbon-containing spacecraft and astronauts had landed on the moon with impunity. But Dr. Steiner's phrase needs to be understood in the context of what precedes and follows it. For the true alchemists, the metals were not really substances, but embodied cosmic activities come to rest on earth. Silver is thus an embodiment of the moon's activity on earth, tin an embodiment of Jupiter, and so on. In this context, carbon may be understood as the metal of the earth, embodying in substance the essential character or activity of the planet on which we live. For the mystery experiences, Dr. Steiner is here describing carbon, the characteristic metal of the earth, becomes metamorphosed into silver on the moon, into iron on Mars, and so on. Just as the planets are ruled by the sun, so the metals are ruled by gold. From this point of view, each planet reveals one aspect of the sun's nature and activity in the cosmos. Similarly, each planetary metal embodies one aspect of gold, in quotes. Carbon, the philosopher's stone, must thus contain within its darkness a hidden presence of the sun. The human spirit, clothed with the help of carbon in a physical body, can strive to awaken to its own sunlike nature and find strength to transform the grave of physical existence, lead, into a spiritual one, gold. It is within this context of true alchemical experience that Rudolf Steiner's remarks about carbon and silver need to be understood. And that's the end of the footnote number two for a comment made by Steiner in this lecture. And this is the end of Lecture 14, the end of the book, Mystery Knowledge and Mystery Centers, Collected Works, Volume 232, by Rudolf Steiner, Revised Translation, by Pauline Werle.